Hello everyone and welcome to another podcast episode. This is actually an intro I'm recording after having done the um, actual podcast recording itself. Um, the, the episode you're about to listen to was actually me the morning, uh, you know, after doing a 24-hour-ish fast and I then extended it up to sort of 30 plus hours. And um, so it just gives some context behind that technique that I often employ. And I've spoken about um, quite a lot after, over the last maybe, yeah, four or five years. And um, so this is just an intro for you. It was recorded very much off the cuff. I got to work and um, was just just kind of feeling great and had all of these questions because I'd mentioned it the day before and obviously get inundated with people who are interested in the whys and the whats. So yeah, this is just provi- setting the scene for you. And so I will um, leave you now to listen to that, but it's I'm literally just sat there in the car outside the office, um, seven o'clock in the morning. I actually only probably slept about five hours, which again, I talk about the the uh, the impact and, and a few life hacks that um, once you understand some of the physiolo- physiological effects of uh, calorie restriction and fasting and these kind of things, you can employ them to help you in, in all different ways um, where they might be helpful dependent on what's going in your li- going on in your life at that time. So yes, it won't be a typical podcast in that I didn't record it specifically for you know stood here in the studio with a microphone but it sounds very good thankfully that's a that's a a real big bonus on this one anyway I hope you enjoy it and um, whilst I've can take the opportunity to I just want to remind you that if you visit martin-mcdonald.com forward slash n-a-n-p obviously not another nutrition podcast you can um, sign up for notifications of each episode, which gives you the time-pointed breakdown of every episode and what's in there in case you just want to skip to specific bits or even just see if listening is worth your time. And secondly, you have the suggestions form there where you can put forward a suggestion for uh, an entire episode. You get to name the episode. Um, what else is in there? Again, as I've said before, if you have implemented, you know, back in episode one, if you didn't listen to it, please do, um, because it gives you some good context for everything that's to come, uh, from now on. But yeah, you can, uh, let me know if you've implemented anything I've said in, in any time period, you know, the last almost two decades of helping people. If you've done something, you've got a story to tell, um, I explain it much better in, in episode one, but there is a place on that form where you can do that. And uh, if it seems like a something that we can do, I'm going to then look into the um, equipment I will need and the logistics of doing an interview with you and recording it. Again, you don't have to be on camera. It'll just be a chat a really, really low-key chat. You don't have to be an expert in anything. Just like the kind of messages I receive in my DMs, I just want you to say that stuff on air for other people um, to hear and hopefully benefit from. Uh, Yes, without further ado, I hope you enjoy this episode. So it is the morning after the day that I fasted. To put it into context as well, I often talk about 36 hour fasts. And the reason I do that is because if you have dinner one day at let's say 8 p.m. For those of you around the world, I actually realized dinner for some of you or in different parts of the UK, dinner is lunchtime. So your evening meal, there's a little lesson in remembering that what you say and mean isn't always what other people hear. So anyway, you have your evening meal at about 8 p.m. 
p.m. and then you go to bed and then you start fasting the next day and then you fast for the whole day and you go to bed and you wake up and you then eat at 8 a.m. the next day. That's 36 hours of fasting as opposed to if you just go, oh, I fasted for that day. You would think it might be 24 hours but because of the two sleeps, it becomes 36. Now on this occasion, I'd actually trained quite hard and this is where, you know, nutrition has intricacies. The basics are what work well and optimizing things is possible. They often aren't game changers and this is why we talk about consistency so much. You know, the long term, the outcome is generally the, the outcome or, you know, the phenotypic outcome, what you end up looking like, is the result of many small choices made over time or, you, you know, can be big choices. But essentially, one decision such as what I did this time isn't a game changer, but it was just a fact that I knew I would recover better from the kind of I'm getting back into training DOMS you know muscle soreness is an issue for me right now because of the fact that my body thinks I'm a newbie again and so I decided to have a very large bolus of protein first thing on my fast day and normally I wouldn't do that I say normally I've only done a few 36 hour fasts in my life but yes that's the background of it so I might extend it a bit further today and some other just interesting teaching while I'm talking about it is I got so many questions about how do you deal with the hunger and there are two different ways you can do a fast and there's many ways you can do a fast two different things that I'll highlight for you which are my car is not warming up as I would expect sorry <laughs> Caffeine and no caffeine, essentially. So you can either, I opted for caffeine on this occasion. Now, sometimes when you opt for, for no caffeine, it can just make, it depends on your goals, things a bit more difficult. So headaches are a common issue with fasting. And a lot of that is that people forget you get a lot of your fluid intake from food. So you have to actively increase the amount you drink. Now, if you reduce your tea and coffee and Monster Ultra consumption on that day, you run the risk of a low fluid intake headache promoter part one part two is you cut your caffeine intake and not only do you feel more than lethargic because of reduction in caffeine intake you feel lethargic because you're not having your normal caffeine hit so headaches and fatigue and thirdly you miss the appetite suppressing effect of caffeine obviously caffeine is not the be-all and end-all it doesn't solve the hunger issue my hunger was relatively good all day it was only at about 10 11 p.m PM that I started to feel a little bit hungry. But yeah, lots of people asking how you deal with the hunger. So caffeine was one. And another was just this, uh, the body's natural reaction to fasting, right? You don't just get hungrier and hungrier and hungrier throughout the day, which is what I think a lot of people imagine happens if they've never done it before. You basically go through waves, natural rhythms, and those rhythms are actually changeable by changing changing your routine and making it consistently different and you get hungry when you usually eat and if you simply ride through that wave I had a couple of cans of Diet Coke yesterday a couple of cans of Monster and then having those at those time the bubbles I'm not a big fan of water for the record I really really struggle to drink just plain water as I know many of you do so that's always an issue with regards to if I wanted to do a caffeine free fast obviously I can go for squashes you know sugar free squashes type stuff as well. So that's one of the main things I wanted to kind of get across in this video or recording. I should probably start calling these dependent on where they're going to go if you're listening in audio only format. But anyway, so yeah, fasting. And then the final thing I wanted to say on this is it's kind of, I guess, a bit of a life hack that when you understand your body or you understand nutrition or you've done these things before, you can use these things to your advantage. When you fast, one of the reasons I'm up so early today is and even just a calorie deficit dieting very often makes you wake up a bit earlier it makes you a bit more alert if you've got everything else in order sometimes you can be a bit more fatigued and I often find people overdo their training during dieting I think maybe this is how I differ from some professionals or it's at least something that other people don't talk about much but it's really ensuring I'm gonna say this as well especially for natural trainers 
says that you moderate your training. You know, in fact, I'm going to be more clear than that. You simply massively reduce the volume of exercise and especially exercise that is stimulatory. You're not trying to be a world beater in the gym. You know, if you're on a very moderate deficit, very moderate, you know, half a percent a week loss, you can probably train as usual, give or take. But you're not trying to be a world beater. You're not trying to make big progress in the gym if you've got a bit more of a deficit and certainly not if you're aggressive dieting. So for me, the goal at the minute will simply be to try and maintain stuff as best as possible. So reduce my volume. There's no strong reason. There's no strong mechanistic reason why I can't still lift heavy in the gym, especially if I, you know, arrange my peri-workout nutrition well, because lifting heavy weights, even for, you know, a, a single set of moderate to high repetitions shouldn't take that much out of me that I can't do what I was doing last week, for instance. I will say this for transparency's sake. I'm coming off the back of this having not been training well. So I'm also in a in a slight position of newbie gains where I will be able to neurally just get better week on week. Like I'm so far from where I've been in the past that, uh, which is nice. And I often, even back when I was competing in bodybuilding, this was the case for, for some of the stuff. And I, I would have a, a big deload, whether that was planned or not, where I just hadn't been at the gym or I'd really backed off at the gym or I'd been away, you know, I'd been on holiday for a couple of weeks or something like that. So going back into it, you get this little recomp effect as well that you're gaining in the gym strength wise you may be regaining a little bit of muscle and you're losing body fat at the same time and everything just feels kind of great to begin with and then by that time you're in the groove of training a bit and especially now with the fact that I just hugely 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 favor aggressive fat loss phases you know as part of a multi-phasic I talk about this multi-phasic multi-faceted you know type of dieting that'd be a good name for some sort of ebook wouldn't it someone else will steal that you watch I mean I already teach MNU students that so you will see it around just make sure that they're quoting me sometimes but yeah in terms of you know this this phase being aggressive and then after you know my plan this time has a lot of elements to it that I will that will become more apparent as I go along but certainly this bit dieting aggressively then maybe going into a bit of a recomp then a kind of heavy heavy muscle building phase and I'm going to talk more about kind of how I'm going to approach it you'll see you'll be able to work it out so if it happens anyway so this life hack thing I was just mentioning is just simply a case of uh, there have been times where I've had a lot of work to get done and you know I've, I've used polyphasic sleep protocols a couple of times which are pretty cool if you're interested in those look into them not great for super high level thinking tasks but when I've just needed to get a lot of work done you know no matter what phase of my life I was in or what I was doing with my nutrition and training being in a deficit fasting these kind of things they can help you be more awake, be more alert. If you look at the literature, we see this in, in lots of the fasting literature. And I, th I think I've written about this before. I do so much more kind of in posts and... Uh videos and stories these days but I think maybe in my intermittent fasting ebook that I wrote so long ago I actually did check up on that and there's not too much in there that I now disagree with which is quite cool you know when you write I've written stuff for so many years you know well over a decade now and you do look back at stuff and you cringe I get it's actually nearing on two two yeah it's almost two decades sheesh that I've been putting out sort of content at least talking about my knowledge around nutrition and training and some of it's horrific you know the the initial stages there's some real embarrassing stuff but even at the start of my sort of relatively evidence-based degree and master's practitioner stuff there's still stuff you change your mind on if you're not changing year on year if you're not updating your knowledge or refining your knowledge you know you're standing still things change science changes but also your understanding of things changes and you can't know everything off the bat so in in my intermittent fasting thing i did mention bcaas which honestly probably now i just see absolutely no use for whatsoever that's another discussion but yeah so in there i discuss some of these hormonal effects that are observed with fasting so the changes in gro growth hormone pulsatility the changes in things like cortisol and adrenaline and these are some of those things that bring about this awakeness this alertness and if you are you know 
I, I really dislike talking about evolutionary theory simply because it is a theory, but it's obviously the most widely accepted, well, not the most, but it's a very widely accepted, agreeable thing. You know, even people who believe in creation, I've seen them get on board, you know, much, much cleverer than me and argue how evolution is part of, of part of creation. So anyway, sorry, I don't like talking about it because it, it's quite an abstract concept, at least for someone who's a relative lay person on that kind of stuff. But if we talk about how we evolved as humans, when, you know, if we talk about us as hunter gatherers or, or anything like this, waking up, not having fed, if there's, you know, relative famine, needing to hunt for food, go out and seek food, not be in a rest and digest state, not be in a, you know, high serotonin, dopamine, mean kind of state we want to be alert mobilizing our energy stores fat stores for instance which is one of the actions of adrenaline binds to the insulin receptor gets rid of that we can release fatty acids into the bloodstream for oxidation i'll just touch on that if you haven't seen any of my other recordings on it that doesn't mean you lose fat faster the speed that you lose fat is dependent on the size of your deficit so anyway this little life hack it's just a case of you know plunging yourself into a big calorie deficit or fasting waking up fresher more awake more alert and and yet yeah, this is really interesting actually one of my friends who's a researcher at Loughborough University Dr Lewis James if he's a professor yet he will be if he's not already he did this you know he, he's always been in this area through his PhD uh, you know and now his research and he published I guess I want to say kind of pinnacle piece of research but it's just uh, it's essentially on this extreme energy restriction which he's always done when I was doing my master's actually he was I think, doing his PhD some of my classmates did his studies which was so interesting he's kind of messed about with electrolytes balance during fasting periods but this more recent paper which was so cool it was you know we hadn't discussed this stuff I was putting out within the industry but essentially showing that the compensation for this extreme energy restriction so obviously yesterday I literally did the protocol they used in this study you wake up the next day and I think people people wake up the next day thinking they're going to be ravenous. It's 8.30 a.m. I've been awake for maybe an hour and a bit. You don't have anything oh. in your calendar at 8.30. Just tell me if you'd like me to create it. Thanks. I'm okay right now. You have a conflict then. Oh. Do you want me to schedule it anyway? No. Where was I? I didn't wake up hungry. I woke up very alert and I'm not hungry now. And it's why I'm thinking. And the other thing is normally I'd wake up, maybe have a cup of tea, but I wanted to get to the office because my scales are here and weigh myself. And I'm going to try and remember to weigh myself. I'm not one of these obsessive weighers. So it, I actually have to remind myself. There you go. Maybe I'll get Siri to do that. And I would maybe have a monster if I didn't want any calories. You know, I wanted a calorie free drink or, or caffeine hit because I can't drink water in the morning. So yeah, this is the thing. And in this this research they've shown you know empirically rather than my anecdote of it but the anecdotes of many have been supported in this instance with the data and that's that we don't seem to compensate the day after a day of extreme restriction and you know this is you know some of the discussion around alternate day fasting which i'm not a huge fan of and again i wrote that way back when i've never been a fan of it for anyone even though there's some efficacy in you know it's been tested in the individuals in the bmi my range of uh, obese and clinically obese so yeah i might extend my fast longer today except i'm want to train well later but obviously i'm now fingers crossed i've got my head in the game this is one of those things that, you know i've spoken about this if you know i think it's mark manson in his book I've, I've not read it annoyingly but everyone quotes it and it's this whole thing if it's not a yes then it should be a no. And, you know, it's funny thinking about that and relating it to what I've talked about a little bit in this thing of that's how you should be approaching a diet. If it doesn't excite you, don't do it. If it's not a fun endeavor, if it's not, if it's not exciting, it needs to feel like I'm starting a new sport. This is cool. This is a new hobby. It needs to be like, I've got a new bike. I'm going to train for a bike race. I'm going to train for a triathlon. Oh, I got a new wetsuit. I'm going to, you know, train for whatever. <laughs> I couldn't really think of anything that wetsuit because i went with triathlon and i was like but you're look, really looking for a new example here martin and then i went to windsurfing and i was like who does that other than my late grandfather who who windsurfed around new zealand when he was like 80 or something crazy huh um man i waste my genetics so where was i don't do it if it doesn't excite you 
it should be a exciting endeavor and so that's why it's taken me so long to get to a point where it feels like it's going to be that and i never know how the start of an aggressive phase is going to feel sometimes it takes a little bit of what's the word edging in i think edging is something a bit oh, something else that we won't go into what is it called basically getting in the groove jeez what's wrong with me there you go that's probably the fast talking i think it's actually age i feel like i'm still young in the grand scheme i do feel like i'm getting stupider with age and i really value my intelligence but again dieting calorie deficit we know it has some kind of fairly chronic effects on the brain quite good so hashtag anti-aging let's hope i get some of that get some of my cro anyway i'm going off topic now don't diet unless you're uh, loving it so yeah today i and i haven't actually decided this is probably a bit bad of me but i haven't actually decided whether i will be calorie counting or not but again we can have different strategies different facets to how we diet so i haven't decided if i'm going to calorie count or if i'm going to do my famous eat as little as you can diet tm then steal it where essentially i just don't eat if i'm not hungry and obviously when you diet on such low calories one of the physiological effects that has been shown empirically in the data is lower hunger when on lower calories beyond a point so again if this is of interest to you if you have not come across this content from me before i have appeared on other podcasts as a guest and talked about this extensively and talked about you know some of the studies that have shown this but it's just very interesting moderate diet versus you know very low calorie diet L even lower than i'm talking about here really 400 600 800 calories my sweet spot is somewhere below 1200 calories it seems and that might change and being changeable and being reflective on each dieting phase is important it's something that people do notoriously wrong when something's hard they just oh, i need to do something else rather than moving intelligently logically scientifically through changing one variable at a time for instance not jumping to the another end of the spectrum but moving yourself along that spectrum the spectrum in this instance being my being my calories last time i did an aggressive diet i was telling amy one of my staff last night that i, I said to her do you remember i, I just kind of went into this three days of and that's the uh, bacon sarni van playing tunes that i really struggled i went went into my deficit for three days and i was starving i was like oh my goodness i my body's changed i no longer benefit massively from these aggressive diets and but i just moved my calories back up and then brought them back down and then i was good to go again so th this kind of getting into the groove this thing that i keep thinking of edging instead of e maybe it's like etching yourself in you know etching is when you like isn't it so like oh, you, you know that's into a groove man i talk a lot cool so i was on actually kind of 12 14 1400 calories that time and brought myself down to 1100 a thousand and boom there it was hunger hunger went and that was calorie counted other times when i've done eat as few calories as possible as i was saying hunger switches off for just eat as little as possible and even riding hunger waves you know always having this unconditional permission to eat it's so important always being flexible in my approach we know that rigid restraint is not good the evidence is so strong on how rigid restraint leads to non-adherence non-compliance you know failure of dieting and whilst it might f seem like eating only a thousand calories is rigid it's not because at any point i can move those up or down should i wish <laughs> at any point i can eat any food i want to at any i don't have a set date which i often talk about is a set date that is outside of my control is extrinsically put upon me i.e a photo shoot a competition a, you know bodybuilding competition i can move where i want to you know having having goals in the short term is very good but those goals even being flexible i, I said this recently to our mentoring lab members is i want you to go away and ponder what flexibility really means with regards to diets because in the industry you know oh, I, I allow myself a range of plus or five grams on my carbs on my macros is not flexibility simply fitting ice cream into your diet is not a flexible diet although it's kind of the most popular aspect of flexible dieting so having flexibility in time scales having flexibility in size of deficits having flexibility in all aspects of what you do so being able to go into a surplus if i should wish to for a social occasion for instance and not seeing it as a failure and not seeing it as an off plan again something that i've highly quoted on is if you are never on plan you can never be off plan you know 
it's literally the opposite end of the spectrum from cheats and horrible things like that that undermine people's mentality and relationship with food. I'll tell you what, this recording has really gone somewhere I didn't expect to, but again, I just think this information is so helpful. If people consumed all of the content I've ever put out, it really allows you to change your mindset around being the master of your own nutrition, physiology, goals, having this, as I said, multifaceted, multiphasic approach to diet dieting and your goals and changing your body composition. See, can you hear my tummy rumbling there? It's breakfast time. So again, I may go and have my first meal of the day. I may ride it out. Another part, when I feel more awake, I imagine I seem relatively awake. I don't feel fully, fully awake. My brain's not working as well as I, you know, like. I'm not a morning person. But eating in the morning doesn't generally interest me too much. I tend to go for much more palatable breakfasts. Often palatable breakfasts aren't always the most satiating. And then Therefore, if I ride out this first hunger wave, oh my goodness, my brain just goes now I'm like starting to think about disordered eating versus normal eating and what's normal for some person might be disordered for someone else and the fact that there's a whole portion of the industry right now that's going if you fast you're 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 gonna give yourself an eating disorder which isn't true stop it and but it is you know fasting is part of you know the paradigm of disordered eating or eating disorders skipping meals it's part of the paradigm but again another quote which I, I need to oh, I wish I could make notes because I've just started doing this in the car it's not gonna happen but the way you think about a restriction your cognition around that your psychology around that dictates the impact of a restriction so oh, social media executive Lucy turning up to work is this there you go she can go and edit this video now that's cool dictates its impact so I am empowered I am in charge of that decision and for that reason the impact of it is very very different and so yes by fasting until lunchtime or just riding out this first wave. Once I'm more awake, I start to favor meals. So I will happily have some of my butternut squash spicy something or other soup that I bought yesterday and some roast chicken breast type thing with some vegetables, green green vegetables that I have. I'll feel more in tune with eating that kind of meal than I would having that. You know, some people who are like robots, your bodybuilder types, they'll eat steak and whatever for breakfast. It's just not me. I would like to have Cocoa Pops or toast with butter and bovril <laughs> not chicken breast and brown rice or fish in a rice cake if you haven't seen it look it up on youtube fish in a rice cake guy okay i'm going to stop there i hope you've learned something i've kind of talked about 10 different topics that i probably should have split into 10 different three and a half minute four minute videos but anyway cool until next time